So I appreciate everyone making time today. I wanted to really just have a conversation about some of the work that we're doing in a upstream project called Open Cluster Management. And this project is really about Kubernetes. So if you aren't familiar with Kubernetes, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth about how Kubernetes works, but at a high level, Kubernetes takes a declarative specification of your app, applies a model called the, the balancing loop, where it continuously reconciles how does the real world match my declared state, and then runs it on a set of, of nodes, right? And these nodes then make up a cluster. So in the end, you take a containerized image and you run container instances on those computers. And that's as much as I'll kind of give in the background of Kubernetes. There's always plenty of great resources about that. But what I want to talk about is what happens when I start to have more than one Kubernetes cluster. There's lots of reasons why I might have more than one. At a minimum, you're probably going to have lower and production environments, right? Dev, test, prod. You might have a scenario where I'm replicating a workload geographically, in which case I want to run some in North America or in multiple regions within North America and some in other regions worldwide. Kubernetes already makes it possible to manage multiple availability zones within a single cluster. So you don't necessarily need multiple clusters for that. But when you start to cross regions, you might need multiple clusters at that point. Or you might have just a cluster for different project teams or lines of business. So Kubernetes makes it easy to run containerized workload, but the way that you adopt this technology is going to lead you to create more than one cluster. And there's plenty of other reasons why you might uh, want more than one cluster. Maybe it's about latency, maybe it's about industry standards, maybe you're trying to balance vendor lock-in concerns, you want to run clusters on different cloud environments. Multi-cloud obviously is becoming more and more of a reality for many enterprises today. And then there's different things that affect scale. Am I talking about small scale startup dev teams or am I talking about telcos? And so depending on where you fit in the spectrum, you might end up starting out with you know, five or 10 clusters, tens of clusters, low tens of clusters. Probably not unless you're a telco where you see more than hundreds of clusters. Telcos and maybe some edge applications, you're gonna see lots and lots of really small clusters everywhere. Telco might see lots and lots of really big clusters, but you're probably somewhere in here, probably between 10 and, and honestly low or mid tens is gonna be, I think the, the bulk of where workloads are today. Kubernetes helps you manage apps. You end up driving to manage many clusters. So what do you need to do to manage clusters? And this is the punchline of the talk is how open cluster management is focused on these types of questions. How do you source your Kubernetes infrastructure? Do you run your own software on, on cloud nodes, on VMware, on bare metal? How do you create clusters? How do you update those clusters over time? So Kubernetes delivers a new release once a quarter. And depending on which version you're picking up, um, most versions to date have typically had a support trend of about nine months. We'll see, I think, uh, the support timeline going out a little bit longer in, in an upcoming release. But ultimately, not only is it about deploying the cluster the first time, but keeping the cluster, the control plane, et cetera, up to date. Once you have created it, you have a way to update it, you know how to tear them down and decommission them, you're going you're gonna to be focused on how do you make them consistent, right? Between dev, QA, and prod, how do I ensure I have the same uh, namespaces, the same policies, the same way that I set quota? Because if I don't manage quota the same way between each environment, I might get to a point where something that ran fine in dev is CPU or memory starved in prod simply because of the way that resource limits are configured between those two environments. Other types of things that Kubernetes can manage, you get into things like access control. So using roles, role bindings, or cluster roles and cluster role bindings, using network policies. Really, every part of the Kubernetes API is managed through these declarative constructs. And so finding a way that you can apply them and then validate and audit that they are consistent that's going to become a big issue over time. Um, not even really over time. I mean, even getting to the point where you've only got a small handful of clusters, just making sure that they match, right? And then applications. We're standing up all of this context because what we want to do 
is run applications with a more continuous delivery mechanism that helps us react more aggressively to changes in the market. Clearly, the pandemic and COVID have driven lots of new changes in the way that technology is applied to business models and the way that consumers interact with the business. So how I distribute apps, again, if I'm running dev test prod, I've got to deal with promoting an app from one stage to the next. If I'm dealing with multiple regions, I've got to deal with making sure that the app is deployed consistently across those regions. And once I get an application up and running, I need to make sure it's healthy, that it's running effectively. So open cluster management is a open community project that is specifically focused on these questions. And to that end, the first question, where do you source your Kubernetes? There's lots of ways to source Kubernetes in the community. The most widely adopted enterprise version of Kubernetes is Red Hat OpenShift. It is 100% Kubernetes. And as you will find when you assemble any project, whether it's a software project, uh, do it yourself at home kit, whatever, Legos, whenever you start assembling things, right, you need to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So when you get Kubernetes, you want to think about how do I monitor Prometheus and Grafana, great ways to deal with that. How do I drive the upgrade lifecycle? Well, Red Hat has really pioneered this notion of operators to help manage those aspects. How do I run projects like Istio or Service Mesh, or excuse me, uh, serverless on Kubernetes? So Red Hat OpenShift is a very widely adopted, very proven enterprise hardened platform that is 100% Kubernetes with all of these aspects that most enterprises typically need. So I'm gonna talk about that, but it's not the open source, uh, open cluster management project is not OpenShift centric. Uh, it will ultimately expand with different Kubernetes distributions. It does support managing uh, projects like enterprise, excuse me, uh, EKS, AKS. So the Amazon managed Kubernetes service, the Azure managed Kubernetes service, the IBM managed Kubernetes service, um, and then Google as well. So you can still manage those types of services already. And one of the things that I want to entice everyone listening to this talk is to look at how you can contribute and get involved for whatever Kube distro is your favorite. Now, when you come to open cluster management, one of the first things that you hopefully will take a look at is the pull request that's currently active in the community that is focused on documenting the formal mission statement. So we are seeking feedback from the community to also help shape what goes on here. And these areas, the questions that I uh, described a slide ago on how you manage the cluster lifecycle, how you deal with policy and configuration, how you deal with applications and how you manage health. These are the four areas that open cluster management is specifically uh, trying to address. And so you can take a look at the PR. It's currently open. It will remain open for a little while. Um, join the conversation. If you'd like to get more directly involved or bring your organization to get more directly involved, we'd love to have that type of participation. So now I'm going to give you a very rapid fire uh, highlight of each of those four areas. We're going to take a look at some running uh, environments and take a look at how these API for open cluster management appear in Kubernetes. And then I'll kind of show you how you can tie all the parts together at the very end. Um, you will not be an expert in this project at the end of this talk, but hopefully this will help drive your curiosity to come and engage, try it out, get involved, etc. So for cluster lifecycle, we're really looking at two primary roles, your traditional IT operations, admin, et cetera, or more of the trendy, buzzish, but really, really powerful roles around DevOps and what's called site reliability engineering or SRE. So each of these roles in different organizations will operate in slightly different ways. I'll oversimplify traditional IT environments, probably more service ticket driven, Still some automation, but maybe it's not tightly coupled. A service ticket comes in, an admin takes care of running automation, returns a result. DevOps and SRE, much more heavily reliant on automation, much more heavily reliant on things like a service level objective and trying to validate are those being met in a running environment. So 
maybe that's kind of the key difference in how these two roles might operate between different organizations today. When those roles interact with open cluster management, they're able to use different parts of the project to provision clusters. And here we're talking primarily the existing support allows you to provision OpenShift on, on the public cloud providers that we have today, Amazon, Google, and Azure. An upcoming release will uh, formalize our support for bare metal and support for vSphere. And obviously OpenShift can be provisioned in many other environments, but when you come directly into the project and look at what's supported out of the box, these are things that you'll see today. We're using Hive as the OpenShift provisioning engine, but once the OpenShift instance is provisioned, it's going to be managed just like any other Kubernetes. If I'm running EKS or AKS side by side, I can deploy the agent. We'll talk about that in just a minute and do things like answer the questions before, apply policies consistently, deliver apps, manage health, et cetera. So from here, I'm gonna entice you hopefully to take a look at, at what this looks like in the community today. Um, in the one hand, we have the design that talks about the different kinds of API. And if you wanna kick the tires on the community version, these are available in the community operator hub.io project. So what does that look like? So if I take a look at the design, here, again, this is under open cluster management. This is in the API project. This captures the core API. A cluster manager, we'll call that a hub. I'll show you what that looks like in a picture in just one more moment. And the clusterlet, that's our name for the agent. So we'll see this sort of hub and attached cluster model to drive the overall management behavior. And then there's some additional API that's part of this project, how we represent a cluster, which is being controlled by the hub and how we deliver sort of the very raw basic building block of how we deliver capability to that attached cluster. And if you wanna try this in your Kubernetes from operatorhub.io, you can simply search for cluster. If you filter it to the Red Hat providers, ta -da, then you'll see both the cluster manager and the clusterlet are community operators that are implementing this API that we're discussing. If you wanna see that in a real cluster, on the left, I have a hub and I'm attached to that, authorized to that cluster, we'll call it Quebec for short. And I'm attached to one of the managed clusters, we'll call it Quebec Alpha for short. So the hub, and let me give you a picture to help conceptualize this. The hub is just a Kubernetes cluster with a little bit of additional parts that are running on it. So more pods, more API, et cetera, more controllers from Kubernetes. And then I have an agent. And again, these are just, these are Kubernetes environments running an agent. The agent is making API calls back to the hub. And so this is how the model looks. And so here I'm calling my hub Quebec and I'm calling one of the attached clusters Quebec Alpha for this demo. And so I can see that cluster manager kind on the hub, and I can see that clusterlet kind on the attached cluster. What does that really mean? What it means is simply that there is a formal API, cluster, what? Close this down over here. Um, there is a formal API that allows you to say, I want to attach a cluster to a hub by creating a clusterlet CR, right? Creating this instance. I give it some parameters about where to attach. I give it an authorization token for the agent to call home. And then it's able to connect to the hub. And what that looks like now on the hub is an instance of a managed cluster. And so I can see my Quebec alpha managed cluster if I look at the YAML. So here I'm simply interacting with the Kubernetes API description of a managed cluster. And I can see that this Quebec alpha cluster um, has been accepted by the hub, meaning that the hub will send it information about the policies or the apps or other things that it wants to be applied. And I can see the conditions that it's currently recognizing the clusterlet as available. It's currently been accepted to be managed by the hub. The admin uh, has, has taken that action of marking 
this sub resource hub accepts client to true. And so now the cluster like can receive work. And so in fact, if I look at the manifest work objects in my Quebec alpha namespace, I can see I'm delivering some information over here. We have some additional layers that are managing a search collector, that are managing the policy controllers, that are managing the apps. And those are getting uh, distributed as running deployments and other uh, pods in a particular namespace over here on the managed cluster. So let me agent, there we go. Um, and so these pods, clusterlet add-on app manager, are specifically created because some time ago on the hub, a manifest work object was applied to the hub, and then it gets federated down to the managed cluster. I'm going quickly because I just want to kind of get the basic idea out there. The hub connects, uh, the actual hub itself is what drives all of the intended behavior for the fleet. The agents connect back to the hub to get their instructions. And all of the API, which controls that protocol and that lifecycle, is part of this upstream uh, API project that you can take a look at under open cluster management. Um, there's nothing here that's really uber specific. It's not specific at all to uh, OpenShift. You can run these on any uh, Kubernetes environment. So cluster lifecycle and that defined API now gives us the building blocks that we can um, attach agents and then drive behavior down. We can also provision clusters as I alluded to before. And for that, we're using an upstream project called uh, Hive. And the Hive project also defines some new APIs. So just like we, we saw manage cluster a moment ago, in this environment on the hub, I also have a set of objects called cluster deployments. And we'll just look for these in all namespaces. And so now I can see that cluster deployment for Quebec Alpha. So not only is there an agent which connects from Quebec Alpha back to the hub, it was also provisioned directly uh, from the hub cluster by creating one of these cluster deployment objects, in this case named Quebec Alpha. And that object then provided all the details needed about which cloud I'm running it on, uh, what um, credentials, et cetera, that I need to, to go and actually run that process of provisioning hosts, uh, sourcing those, no, those uh, operating systems into running Kubernetes nodes, establishing the control plane, establishing the worker nodes, et cetera. So manage cluster, clusterlet, cluster manager, those are all API kinds that help us attach an agent and drive behavior. Hive gives us this, these additional kinds and cluster deployment is just one of several that's part of Hive. But again, I just want you to kind of dig away that big idea Hive helps you provision OpenShift on virtually any cloud environment. Now that you have clusters, and again, we're going fast here, but now that I can provision clusters, how do I drive consistent configuration against those clusters? So in this area of open cluster management, we're really looking at policy-driven governance, risk, and compliance. So we're looking at roles like a security ops person or a chief information security officer, a CISO type role, where that type of role is looking at, I want to follow a certain standard. I want to follow PCI DSS. I want to follow a NIST 853. I want to follow uh, some other HIPAA, healthcare, government type related st uh, standard. Some of those standards like PCI require operational behavior, how changes get uh, validated or vetted before they're made. And some of them can be reduced to a technical control, like specifically a namespace should not allow any uh, incoming network access except on ports one, two, three, four, whatever. And so those technical controls are what we are representing now as policies that again are another API kind that can be delivered against those managed clusters. So if we take a look at an example of what that API kind looks like, I might look for policies that are defined on the hub. So we'll do that here on the left. So I've defined a policy for something like auth provider. And a little bit of a preview, one of the concepts that's really important here is this idea of a placement rule, which allows me to describe what clusters I want 
my policies to be deployed against. And so if I want to pick on something like the auth provider, I can look at its governing placement rule and look at the YAML. And this fits out a whole bunch of YAML, which under the covers is actually what says, I want to match any cluster that says it has an authentication profile with a value of HT password. Now, if I go back, you can see it's already matched Quebec Alpha. If I go back to the API and say, show me what's in the uh, managed cluster for Quebec Alpha, one of the things that you should see is a label. And here I can see the labels include authentication profile, HT password. So the placement rule is dynamically saying this policy should be matched to this specific cluster. And now over here, if I go and look, I can find the OAuth kind for that. I'm going to forget exactly what that kind is named. So I'll just go back up here. I'm not the placement rule, I want the policy. And so here I'm going to show you that that policy is defining a required object for the OAuth configuration on my OpenShift cluster. Kind OAuth. Oh, and apparently spelling is important when you're talking about API constructs. Who knew? And in this case, if I look at the content of that object, um, the short answer is I'm going to see this HT password identity provider. And it's there not because a admin went and manually created it on that Quebec Alpha managed cluster, but rather because an admin went to the hub and said, here's my policy, here's my placement rule, go make it happen, right? And it might match one cluster, it might match 100 clusters. The hub is that control plane which is driving consistency across the fleet. And the way that these policy controllers work ultimately allow us to drive those defined policy APIs on the hub, propagate them down to a managed cluster, and not only create the object the first time, but help give us a feedback loop that helps us understand whether it's constantly in compliance or not. Policies, you can create your own. There's a great blog that we published to talk about how to create your own policy controller. And in the community, again, is a set that uh, of policies that's being defined with many participants, including Red Hat and NIST, which helps us create sort of a stable, uh, consistent library of policies out of the box that are consistent with technical controls in NIST 853. And so you'll see some that are already there. Some of these you saw in my environment, like defined roles or role bindings as examples. So. Policies, again, an open source way to uh, declare, I want a certain configuration to be available, um, or I might want to drive behavior like OPA. So we can ensure that the OPA gatekeeper policy framework is running on every cluster and that the rego statements that OPA uses to configure some dynamic behavior are applied consistently to the fleet as well. All right, we're pushing forward here. We got 20 minutes to go. We can drive creating clusters. We can drive attaching clusterlets and managing clusters. We can drive policy that gives us consistent configuration across clusters. What about the apps? So in this case, typically the DevOps SRE role or the IT operations role is what we're focused on in this project from a user community perspective. Open cluster management is not really scoped to try to make it easier to scaffold an application or as a developer, simply to have an edit compile debug loop with my Kubernetes cluster. It's really more about the roles that are helping take an application from an early stage like development and promote it across the various stages of the pipeline. And then when it's in production, deal with aspects like scaling it out, placing it more dynamically, um, adjusting how much um, adjusting perhaps moving applications from one cluster to another because of maintenance issues or whatever. 
but it's really more about the work, the roles which are actually helping to manage the running applications once they've been developed and created. And the core idea here is, is really one that's been consistent with continuous delivery for a long time. You attach a subscription to a cluster and it's gonna go and collect information from that subscription and apply it to that cluster. Okay, well, where do I get my content from subscriptions? Ultimately, there's a couple of options, GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, your favorite Git. Uh, hopefully that's one of your favorite Gits. If not, come join the community, add support for your favorite Git if it's not one of those three. But GitHub is probably gonna be the most common. It's definitely the most common that you see in examples in the project today where I have a set of Kubernetes manifest, maybe they're straight YAML, maybe they're Helm charts, maybe I'm using customize, but I've got that Kubernetes uh, set of declared objects in my Git repo. And I create a subscription that says, go get content from this Git repo as it changes over time. Now, that's kind of interesting, right? Now, instead of having to apply a change directly, we're driving a GitOps driven model and what's a little bit different from the way that projects like Argo do it, and, and I'll comment on that just a little in just a minute, but here that notion of dynamic placement behavior, again, plays a significant role in how you not only drive the link from GitHub to the hub, right, from Git to your hub cluster, but how I dynamically deliver content to the fleet. And Git is not the only source. You can also pull content from a Helm repo from an object store. And there's even kind of a built-in way that really is only used for dev where I kind of templatize an object and put it in a namespace and kind of treat the namespace like a poor man catalog. But really it's gonna be probably get Helm or an object store. And so if I just wanna apply it to one cluster, I create the subscription, I'm pulling content continuously, it'll get updated. But where this becomes more interesting is when I have content that gets applied to a hub and then I'm using those dynamic placement rules to deliver my application out. And so if I take a look again at kind of what that looks like, here I've got a subscription that is on the hub. So remember on the left, I'm dealing with a hub. On the right, I'm dealing with my manage cluster. And that one showing me propagation failed. So I had something that changed in my Git repo in the last couple of minutes that triggered a change. So one of my partners is making a change there, but it's not gonna affect what I wanna show you here. Um, but the subscription itself is saying, go get content from a Git repo. That example happens to be coming from a repo called Kate's Pac-Man app. You can go play with this uh, behind the scenes if you want an example for a project today. But again, that notion of placement rule becomes really powerful because I can say where I want that application to be deployed against a running environment. And so in this case, it's targeted to a few, unless my cohort has made a change behind me, it should be running on three clusters. Okay, so Quebec Bravo got taken out, but right now it's running on two clusters. So something changed in the running clusters and instead of running on Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, it's now just running on Alpha and Charlie. Still good. The placement rule says run it on at least uh, clusters that match these labels. And in this case, there are only two clusters in my fleet that currently match that label. So we're, we're doing good there. Um, in this case, the application model uh, drives this notion of placement rules as kind of the unique way that open cluster management delivers content to the fleet. Now with that, let's take a look at Pac-Man. So I've showed you kind of the API from the command line, things that you can assemble from the upstream project. Um, one of the ways that Red Hat delivers content in this community is in an offering called Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management. I'm gonna show you that UI because it's gonna show you the same API concepts that we've been discussing. You can go play with this, I would love for you to, but really what I wanna get you enticed to do is to come and play with the upstream project itself, those community operators, et cetera. So what I'll do is I'll kind of switch gears into showing you some prettier pictures rather than the API uh, layout that we saw a minute ago. And so here I can see those same managed clusters that were attached shortly, uh, attached in the, um, in the console. But now I can just see a UI that shows me what's running and I can see a little more clearly what's going on in that cluster. 
I can see the version of Kubernetes it's running. I can get access to the cluster API, the console. Um, I can show you my creds, but I don't really want to, so I'm not going to do that. And then we're pulling information like the nodes and then details like cluster settings and whether things are healthy at this point in time. So here we're driving this behavior. Now, one of the other things I want you to pay attention to is I have OpenShift clusters that are not only running in a single cloud, but actually running in multiple clouds at the same time. And so now what I'm getting with OpenShift is this consistent open hybrid platform, right? So we'll call that the open hybrid cloud. And my application, which I'm gonna show you in just a minute, can assume in every environment that my OpenShift distribution of Kubernetes is gonna look the same. And that becomes powerful now if I want to scale things across different clouds without having to worry too much about all the nuances between clouds. Showed you managed clusters, I showed you policy. This is what policy looks like in the UI. We looked at that auth provider policy very quickly. We can see that I had one cluster. Notice now that instead of just showing that it's delivered that configuration to the cluster, I can see that it's constantly reconciling to see if that cluster is within compliance. And so here I'm attached, it's enforcing that change. I can see that OAuth provider object that's being applied to a configuration policy. And I can see the actual expression. So this is the placement rule that we saw in the console just a minute ago. And again, that authentication profile must match HT password. Quebec Alpha has that label, it's applied, it's being validated, it's compliant, great. Some of the other examples here, this shows up better in the user experience. Some of these policies are not in compliance. Uh, in this case, I have an audit policy, which is simply saying, I want you to tell me whenever a cluster doesn't match this policy, or in this case, this role is a uh, sort of view auditor role. I can see what that looks like here. I can see that Kubernetes object being defined as part of the policy. And if the auditor role doesn't exist on the managed cluster, then I want you to report that as a violation. And so here it's matching every cluster in my fleet and it can tell me they're all not compliant. It's gonna generate an alert when it finds any non-compliant cluster. I can have that trigger additional behavior to notify me to reconcile it. Maybe I'm using a different automation tool for some reason. It might be a type of policy that can't automatically correct a problem. What kind of policy might that be? Well, it turns out when you've got a container that's running in a hub in a, in a cluster that's in the fleet, and that container image has a vulnerability, we can't correct it from the control plane. We have to look for the user to fix the image, deliver a new version through our, whatever pipeline your organization defines, and ultimately update that running container instance in the fleet. And at that point, it'll take away, in this case, the violation because I have something that's non-compliant. In that case, the operator is deployed, but on Quebec Alpha, I've got some container in the book import namespace, uh, which is not, uh, that has a vulnerability in the container instance it's running because it needs a newer version of the image uh, running that container. So policies can be really powerful. There's also some examples with OPA, which we're not gonna get to, but ultimately policies now allow us to drive that consistent configuration everywhere. Okay, created clusters, managed clusters, deliver policy. Now let's talk about applications. And for that, I'll come back and switch here. So I, I alluded to the Pac-Man example and in my slide, it was running on three different clusters. In this case, the placement rule attempted to take one of those clusters out. And so one of the clusters that it should be running on, actually now it's back up. Um, so now it's actually deployed it against Bravo again. So behind the scenes, when it went into that failed state, something on Bravo changed, now it's changed back. Now it's actually deployed it and running on these three different clusters. And I can uh, actually see the route that it's running behind and even open that application up if I wanted to do that. For anyone that's paying enough attention at home and goes and pokes at that URL, we'll see Pac-Man and you can play along at home for fun running in my environment. And that in case it's running on one cluster and then it's got a route with a load balancer in front of it. And so here, I've got two OpenShift clusters. So Alpha and Charlie are on AWS, Bravo is on Google, and the public route in front will pick one of the three different clusters to run it on. And the way that this app got created and was deployed in that cluster 
was through a subscription, which was matched to a placement rule. So at a high level, the key value here is that open cluster management helps you drive continuous updates and dynamically place them against clusters in your fleet. And it might have one subscription for the app. It might have multiple. So I might have the front end. In this example, both the Mongo back end and the, um, the front end itself are under one subscription. But I could have broken these up. And so these two deployments could be placed governed by different placement rules. If I wanted to have the data plane in a separate set of clusters, then the front end control plane or the front end API or UI environment. Um, and again, all of this is backed by API. So here again, just going back a quick review. Um, these are the same commands just run from part of the UI called uh, Visual Web Terminal. And I can see the cluster manager. Um, the cluster manager again is that API construct that says I will take over the role of a hub and I create this uh, as part of that operator. Then I've got managed clusters like Quebec Alpha. This is a API construct that says there is some remote cluster that is attached to this hub and wants to accept directives from you. Those directives are things like policies. So if I want to drive how I configure my auth, auth provider, I can do that through a policy and I can place it against certain clusters. Um, and then I can drive subscription behaviors as well. If I want to drive a subscription that applies policy, like if you go and look at the policy collection repo that I, I had up a minute ago, I can actually deploy that from a Git repository. So I can have all of my configuration policies driven from Git, applied to the hub, dynamically placed against clusters in my fleet. So overall, this gives you now a way with a community project to make that process of creating new uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes clusters easier and then uh, managing them over time. I did not have time today and I won't be able to show you how we do observability. I'll show you this fancy picture because what I want you to take away is really just that we're using other open source projects like Thanos and Grafana um, in order to attach Prometheus from a managed cluster and drive a, um, a collector back into that hub cluster that understands health metrics for managed clusters. And so now we'll be able to actually see how an application is running. Is it running correctly? Are the alerts firing on that managed cluster? And we'll be able to see all that from the hub without having to log into each of those different consoles and dashboards. And then I showed you some of the UI here, just a whirlwind tour. What I want you to take away is not any particular little detail, but rather I want you to take a look at the upstream project. I want you to to get involved. And in this case, we do have a new offering, uh, a new version coming out very, very soon. And we'll see some updates, the ones that are highlighted here. Um, you can also deploy this through an operator in the OpenShift catalog. But the little parts, the cluster manager, the cluster list, the policy controllers, the application subscriptions, those are all parts that are part of the community uh, operator hub today. So applications use this multi-cluster subscription operator um, Hive allows you to create OpenShift clusters against different uh, cloud providers, cluster manager and cluster that we talked about quite a bit. So go take a look. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take those. We, we should have about five minutes, I think, left for questions. Um, if not, uh, I will happily dive back in if we want to see something more detailed or yield the time for everyone to get coffee before the next talk. And I'm looking in the Q&A and looking in the chat for questions. And Norma, maybe you can help me if there's another place I should be looking for these as well. Norma, let me confirm. I do not hear your audio. And our moderator may have stepped away for just a moment. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, and I don't see any raised hands. Um, appreciate everyone's time today uh, in the pandemic. If there's any more questions, if there are anything, if you poke around in the project and um, wanna reach out, you can reach me uh, in a number of ways. Um, probably the easiest would be Twitter. I'll go back to the slide here. That should have a couple of ways. 
Um, you can ping me on Twitter, um, send me an email, mdelder at redhat.com. I'm more than happy to kind of chat about ways uh, for folks to get involved in the community. We will begin sort of a regular cadence of open community meetings that will run much like the Kubernetes SIGs do. We are participating where possible uh, to you know, cross-pollinate with projects like OPA. We expect to do more of that with Argo, uh, with projects like SIG policy, SIG multi-cluster as well. So really what we're trying to do with this one open cluster management arena is form a community that tries to address that holistic view of how we manage Kubernetes fleets. Um, so with that, thank you so much for your time today and, uh, and have a great day.